Hello, everybody. This is Cody Bateman. Welcome to a brand new episode of our Relationship Marketing Podcast. We are, as usual, we're very excited to do the show today. Very excited for the guests that we have on today. We have Celebrity in the House today. Celebrity uh -huh. in the House. Uh, I'm going to do a big bio introduction, but before I do this, uh, Lewis House, welcome, welcome to the show, brother. How you doing? Thanks, Cody. Doing well, man. It's good to, good to connect here. Well, I'll tell you what, it's an honor to have you on with us. Uh, we've been excited to do this for quite some time. Uh, appreciate our good friend Bart Ratliff for setting this up for us. And uh, we're, we're, we're excited for this show today. Big fan. You know, I've got this, my daughter, I mentioned in the pre-show um, pre to you that my daughter actually bought this book, your book, mm -hmm. School of Greatness, for me. I don't know, it was probably about a year ago yeah. uh, from the bookstore and she organ she organically found you on the internet <laughs> and uh, became a big fan and highly recommend this book, which was a great book. Uh, and by the way, those uh, podcasters, if you're on YouTube, you can see me holding this up. It's called The School of Greatness from Lewis mm -hmm. House. And then you got a brand new one out. Uh, I'm going to put this up too for our YouTubers. Uh, the Mask of Masculinity, mm -hmm. and I just started looking through this one this morning, and and I want to I want to ask questions on this. <laughs> ah, whatever you want, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be great. But um, Lewis, uh, you're in high demand. You're all over the place. You're interviewing who's who of everybody. So it, it's just an honor to have you on with us. I, I was on your YouTube channel earlier today, checking out some of your interviews just just incredible stuff so congratulations you. on your success my friend really thank good. you very much Cody appreciate it so let's let's talk to our listeners a little bit about who you are um, man the, you know he you, you've got you've got some stuff here that, that the rest of us you know we're aspiring to get to the <laughs> level you're at um, so Lewis hosts a top 100 iTunes ranked Apple podcast it's called the school of greatness uh, it has over 100 million downloads and over 800 episodes since you launched it in 2013. Those are big numbers, my friend. Those, those are fun. big, big yeah, numbers. By the way, what do you attribute all that to? You started in 2013 and, you know, you, people knew you. I mean, you're, you, you're a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, definitely you've been around and people know who you are, but my man, since 2013, that kind of success, like what do you attribute that to? I think uh, really three things. One is being very clear on my vision of what I want to create and the future life that I want to have. And uh, I saw myself, you know, six and a half, seven years ago, wanting to have a podcast that reached 100 million downloads every single week. And so we just crossed 100 million downloads in six and a half years. And now it's okay, how do we do it in one year and then one month and then one week and then repeat that so we can impact more people consistently. So the vision, the clarity of that was the first thing. I would think the, the second thing is um, my, my commitment to consistency. You know, you've been doing, sending out cards for I think, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years in some, some, some way. And um, it's hard to build something great in a couple of years and in and out, dabbling, a uh, little here and there, spread energy thin. As you know, uh, we've got to go all in and be consistent. So I've just been consistent. I wish there was some easy hack to just spike the traffic and get the numbers and get people to listen. I wish there was, but it's just time and consistency and being committed over time. I think the third thing is <clears throat> what, what your business is a lot about, which is relationships. You know, I met Bart probably a decade ago when I was doing LinkedIn stuff back in St. Louis and you know, I'm on this show because of a relationship that he built with me 10 years ago without that relationship. You know, I want to be on the show most likely. Um, and the same thing with my show and, and my business and brand. It's like I continue to build relationships and just try to be a good person. Just try to add value first, never ask for anything in return unless I've got some big thing that I'm looking to do and then ask for support from friends and truly make, try to make everyone a friend by, by being of service, by being of value, by being curious, by being kind, and not making them feel uncomfortable. And I think you guys do an amazing job of that. You're always looking to help people and give and serve through the service you offer with Send Out Cards. So for me, being clear on my vision, being committed to consistency day in and day out, three times a week, you know, for six years now, and um, 
building quality relationships because our ability to enroll people in our vision is what sets us apart or what makes something happen or not. You know, if we can't communicate our clear vision of what we want, what we're excited about, other people aren't going to get on board with us. And so I've been able to communicate my vision about my show and what I want to bring to the world through my relationships over years and ask people to come on and ask my audience to listen and ask my audience to share. And I think that's, that's paid off. Wow. That's great. I hope everybody's got their uh, notepad and their pen Uh out because this is some good stuff. Take some good notes today um, on this. Now I'd kind of like to add to your list of three. The first one you say vision based on what you said it's not, you're not talking this vision. You're talking big vision. Like right. I would add the word big. Cause when you say, I mean, the first thing you said is you had a vision of a hundred million downloads, not in six years, not a, in a week, year, but in a week. Yeah. So when you every first week, started every week, over and over, that's the goal. All right, so, so when you started, you, you, you're just starting out, you're telling our listeners that when you just started out, your clear, distinct vision was a hundred million downloads a week yep and it started with it's and it started with i hope everybody pays attention to it's not just clear vision it's having a big vision yeah that's what impresses me about you is just it's not just vision man it's it's big look if you go go big or go home right and the challenge is and you're probably you probably seen this you know you didn't set out to hey let me just have a printing company that ships some cards you said probably something like I want to ship a billion cards a year because that's a a billion people's lives that feel appreciation, that feel acknowledgement, that feel gratitude, that feel connection, community. Like I'm maybe I'm wrong, but it's not, I'm assuming this is probably something along the lines of what you were. No, thinking. actually from day one, even before we could ever send a card, it was always my vision to help millions of people to act on their promptings every day to reach out in kindness. So millions of people every day. So I do have a That's similar big. story that you do. And I'm just, I'm, I'm really impressed at that 100 million downloads a week. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's a bit. And probably similar to you, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but uh, for me, it started, it started with one episode and one listener. That's right. And you probably started with one card right. and to one person. Right. It wasn't a million cards a day the first day. You know, I don't know if it took three years, five years. I don't know how long it took for you, but for me, it took a while. And I think a lot of people aren't willing to stay committed to their vision for the first few years when it's challenging, when it's not much momentum building, when it's not fun necessarily, when there's no money coming in. That's challenging. And I think that's the difference maker between people who – um are able to stay in something in the long haul as opposed to people that are in and out of things all the time. Yeah, no question. I I remember the first event that I ever did on teaching a seminar on uh, helping people act on their promptings. We did in a public library, West Jordan, Utah. Nice. And and six people showed up. Six (sighs) people showed up. Three of them were very closely related and the other three were friends and they showed up. People off the street. Yeah. And no one off the street. We tried. I mean, we did advertising and everything and nobody showed that way, but we had six people in the room and what do you do when there's six people in the room? You put on the event. I mean, the show goes on, the show goes on and you do it. And, and I've noticed that you've done that again. You know, Bart knew you way back when you were getting started and we kind of know and been able to follow, um, you know, how you have grown over the years. It's just, it's, it's very cool. So, contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, been featured on The Ellen Show, Good Morning America, The Today Show, New York Times, People, Forbes, Inc., Fast Company, ESPN, Sports Illustrated, Men's Health, and other major media outlets. So, been there, done that, all around the world kind of guy. Not only that, but you, man, dude, like you're, you're, putting, on, you're putting on some of my heroes. You know, you've You've had on your show Brandon Burchard, Grant Cardone, Kobe Bryant, Tony Robbins. I'm just naming the ones that, like, I really – like, I like these guys. Like, yeah. you know, I, I follow these guys and, you know, big fan of Kobe Bryant, not not necessarily because of what he did on the court, but what he's done off the court. Mm-hmm. It's just been phenomenal to, to watch him 
And uh, so you're, you're, like you said, you know, you've been able to create relationships. That's one of your three things. Yeah. But you're bringing in big, big people on your show. That's from relationships, you know, without relationships, you know, at, at this level, I've got a bigger show now that more of these bigger names want to come on because I've got a platform and I have an audience. But in the beginning when I had no audience, I had relationships as my, really my only asset, my ability to connect with someone, my ability to get in front of them build some type of friendship or relationship, offer a lot of value to them, and then see if they'd be interested in me promoting them when the timing was right. I think that's key. A lot of people get frustrated when they ask someone to come on their show or YouTube channel, or whatever it may be. People have agendas. They're busy. They have a lot going on. And I always try to make it the right timing for the person. I always said, when do they have a book, a movie, or something that they want to get out that's when I'm going to ask them if I can promote them. And I would do a lot of crazy stuff. You know, if I really wanted someone, I'd be like, hey, I'll buy 500 copies of your book to have you on my show and I'll promote you to try to sell more of them. Like I just try to make it like, uh, of course, I'll give you 30 minutes of my time. When they have something they want that they care about the most in their heart and you're willing to provide a, a value for them for that, it's, it's a no-brainer. So I just try to connect the thing that they care about the most and support them with that thing. It might be a charity, a book, whatever it may be. How do you find those things out? Like what kind of research do you do? Oh, man. I'm just constantly observing people. I think I'm always seeing what people are talking about, what they care about on social media, on Instagram or Twitter, or, you know, with LinkedIn back in the day. And I'm just observing. I also do a lot of research of who's got books coming out a year in advance. I have lists from different publishers that I'm just like constantly researching and see who's got a book coming out in 2020 that I can start talking to their publicists now and start seeding like, Hey, let's get them on. Let's make it happen. Let me help promote this. I'm going to sell thousands of copies. So I'm constantly doing research, um, you know, building relationships in and person. Do you, yeah. do you have a staff of people to help you do that? Or do you do that on your own? Or how does that the relationship management side of things is pretty much 99% me. Uh, you know, every now and then I get a lucky bone where someone throws me something in my team or whatever, but it's mostly my team is working in the business on other things, but I've tried to have like different bookers kind of help me book the show, but it's never really worked out. And, um, I know this guy named Bart Ratliff. He's pretty good. There at you it. go. Yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's just like, you know, the people I want to have on, I'll, I'll comment on all their content. I'll comment on their posts on social media. I'll listen to their show. I'll share their stuff. I just try to get in their ecosystem so they're aware of me first. And then hopefully when they're aware of me, they'll follow me. And if they follow me, I can message them and build that relationship. And it's really like a slow process. I'm not looking to find someone to get them to come on in the next day or build this overnight relationship. It's years. Now you talked about social media and you're making comments and you're posting and you're doing stuff like that. So you do all that on your own. Yeah, I do all on my own. So how much time a day do you spend doing that? Um, on like researching and commenting, it's probably a couple hours a day if I'm being honest. Really? Like, now, now I've got to, I've got to, from your phone or from a computer or a lot from my phone. I've got my team that now is posting all my content for me and uh, you know, kind of sharing it and posting it. I used to do all that as well until last year. So my team posts content and I'm kind of doing research and like sending private messages to people. Wow. So, so you, do, do you like time, uh, time block that? Like you take it two hours specifically I, a day? I wish, I wish I could tell you that I was smart with it, but uh, I'm probably not that smart with it. And then I just kind of do it whenever I feel well, I'll tell you, there's a specific reason I'm asking because I struggle with this. You know, yeah. I've been told by my team, you know, Cody, you got to get out there more. You know, you got to do Facebook lives all the time. You got to be commenting on every stuff. You got to be doing all this stuff. And, and I, it's, it's a struggle. In all honesty, it's a struggle for me. And I'm speaking, yeah. maybe I'm speaking, I don't know. Maybe I'm speaking to the older group listening here. Maybe not so much to the millennials or Gen Xers or whatever. But to me, I, I, I struggle a little bit because I don't like living my life through the lens of a phone. I, I sure. don't. I don't like it. I like to go live, man. I like yeah. to get on my motorcycle and ride. I don't like, you, you know what I mean? So I think you, you can have someone on your team. We have to adjust. So how yeah. do we do it? I think you should have someone on your team do that for you, to be honest. <laughs> I think you should have someone dedicated to your voice, to your message that's posting. That's um, And maybe you spend... 30 minutes once a week going over content that they have pre-scheduled for the whole week 
and you approve the comments and the copy and you, t you dictate what you want it to say. And then they're in there replying to people's comments and kind of engaging through that. And they could say in the bio, like, you know, Cody's in here sometimes, but also team Cody is in here replying. So it's authentic and, and genuine. Right. And um, you shouldn't be focusing your time on it. You should be focusing on uh, the business and the team that you have and growing, growing the mission that way. But you should have a, I believe you should have, um, what's it? You should be out there in some ways on social media. And right. some, someone should be using your voice to put it out there. It doesn't need to be you. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's interesting stuff. I always like asking questions like sure. that. You, know, you social media guru guys that know, <laughs> know what you're doing on all this stuff. Uh, this podcast is doing well for us. I mean, we're really starting to take off. The viewership's uh, growing pretty rapidly each week. And so we're pleased with that. And a lot of that I attribute, actually most of it I uh, attribute to the quality guests that we have on. And so yeah. So I wanted to ask you that. I mean, you obviously you're in the major leagues when it comes to to podcasting. Your top hundred podcast on on Apple or on iTunes, and uh, I mean, how much do you attribute it to your marketing efforts versus the content versus the type of guests or whatever? I think it all play. It's all combined. You know, I can have a big guest. But if the content that we talk about isn't good, then people are going to stop listening in the middle of it and they're not going to share it. I can have a no name guest uh, or a no name who's not like some big celebrity, but I have an incredible content. And it's, you know, we have some that our biggest episodes are with people that aren't that well known. Yeah. But yeah. the title, the marketing is really good because we titled it right. We have great uh, action points and the content is lights out. And so I think if the marketing is solid and the content backs it up and you have some, uh, you know, great guests as well, then you kind of hit the trifecta. But I do a lot. Uh, I try to do more just solo episodes of myself because my audience wants to hear more from me. Uh, that just takes a little bit more time of developing the content, but I'm sure people want to hear just from you as well. There might be some type of series you could do with that. Interesting. Interesting. So, so I've got a high profile guy on my show right now. Um, how are we doing so far? Are people still going to listen to us? Are we, are we doing okay? Is our yeah, content okay? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I, I, think, I think as long as we uh, open up and share a lot of value and vulnerability and, and really be authentic, then people are going to be interested. Yeah, well, listen, we, uh, it's, it's kind of fun. This is a, a little bit of a unique interview because it's just this, this is – probably the most casual conversation I've had on a show, but I like it. I, I like it. I yeah. think it's great. Um, Keep it real. Yeah. Now listen, I, so I want to talk to you about our show is about relationship marketing mm -hmm. and we believe that relationship marketing is about the first word, not the second. It's uh, 80% should be focused on, on relationship. You sprinkle 20% marketing into it. That's what constitutes a great relationship marketing plan. And, most people, when they think relationship marketing, they think about the second word mm -hmm. more than the first. Like, what's in it for me? You know, yeah. what, what's so, so marketing, like what's my return on investment kind of thing, where we're trying to teach constantly that, no, if you, you need to focus on the relationship side of it, and then the marketing kind of takes care of itself. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed that in, well, I've noticed it in the, in the messaging you've already said on our show here today, you know, the importance of serving people, being there for them, researching them before you talk to them, you know, offering them something, you know, they want, um, being genuine with people and you're really good at that. So talk to us a little bit about in today's day and age, because you get today better than most, you're very successful in today's format world. How important is that today? How important is relationship over marketing today? Or is it there? Do you think I just is? feel like relationships is the only thing. I think, um, I don't know, just the, the older I get, you know, I just turned 36 a couple months ago, and the ups, the downs, like just the, the things that happen in life, I just feel like you learn about yourself through the adversity and the challenges in your life more than when things are really good. And you learn about how, how strong your relationships are through adversity in your life. I don't know if you've had something in your personal life or your business where 
you guys were under attack at some point or there were some financial challenges or any of those things. But when you go through adversity, Cody, I'm assuming that you find out who really, how strong your relationship equity is with the people in your circle. Do they support you when you're going through challenges? Anyone can support you when you're successful and everyone wants you. But do, do those, are those relationships strong uh, when you are on a downturn in your life or when you lose your job or when your business is suffering? And I think that's when we start to learn about yourself the most. I've learned about myself the most through the downturns. And of all the people that reach out to me, it's amazing to see like, wow, okay, you know what? I've been adding a lot of value for a lot of years that no matter what happens to me, uh, there's going to be people there for me that always want to support because I've supported them for years without asking for anything. And I think that's the only thing we have is relationship equity. Um, you definitely thought, learn who your friends are. You, you learn about that, right? Yeah, you definitely learn who your friends are. It's interesting that you say that, you know, and uh, permission for complete transparency, you know, even prior to going on this show, you know, prior to going on this show, we, you know, I run several companies and, yep. uh, you know, and we've got some branding that we're doing. We're getting this podcast up and going. Uh, I've got a book that's out, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. And when you do business and you put yourself out there, you face challenges. There's, mm -hmm. there's challenges that you face in business that a lot of people in the marketplace never see. Never. I'm sure there's challenges that you face on a daily basis, the way people see you is here's this guy is on top of the world. He's got all this stuff, but nobody sees the, the challenges right before coming on this show today, right before getting you on here and starting this podcast, I was dealing with some insurmountable, seemingly insurmountable challenges. See, isn't that <laughs> it? I was literally thinking to myself, okay, man, I got to shift my mind here. Cause I, I, got I was coming on. I, I was shift my mind, man. I, I got, was laying down for 15 minutes doing meditation because I was feeling really frustrated about something else that was happening in my business. And I was like, I need to shift and be present. Cause if I don't show up for Bart and Cody, I'm going to hear it afterwards. So for me, I was like, I need to calm my emotions and not allow my, my emotions to turn into reactions and focus more on my vision of how I want to show up in the world. Who is the person I want to be? that would be inspiring in this moment, not someone who's reactive in this moment. Uh, and it's something I work on every, I'm sure you, you've got a lot of moving parts. I mean, you've got a, probably a thousand employees and tons of businesses, like you said, and there's a weight on your chest that probably 99% of the world will never know what really feels like. And they expect you to have the answers. They expect you to have the calm and the peace all the time. But I know, that you probably have a thousand more challenges than me with the complications of the industry you're in and the business. And you also have children. I don't have kids. I'm not married yet. So for me, I can only imagine the amount of uh, daily challenges just by having kids that you get to, that you have the privilege of facing uh, being a father. So um, yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, you get to learn a lot about people on how they handle the challenges and how they continue to show up for people in the face of adversity. But don't you think that's really important for people to hear what we're saying right now? I mean, sure. think about it. The, the, the listeners on this podcast right now, they, they, you do. Heck, we do it. I do it. I mean, I, I, I look on social media and see the big icons, and, and it's just human nature. You look at that persona and think, man, how are they doing it, man? How are these guys like they got it all together? I swear I'm doing all the same things, but but I don't realize what they are dealing with. Yeah. <laughs> it's like people don't realize what I'm dealing with, and same with you. And yeah, it's so important that everybody hear this, you know. And and I wish there was more transparency out there. People are always trying to put their best selves out there. Yeah. And I think transparency is important, which by the way, I think that's a little ah. bit about what this is about. Yeah. Isn't it? It is. I, I mean, mean, I started I started looking through this the latest book, The Mask of Ma uh, the Mask of Masculinity. I got to be honest, when I first look at this is like masculinity. Do I want to read about it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. The more I uh I the more I kind of got older in my 20s, it was all about my image. It was all about trying to look good at all times, trying to prove people wrong, trying to be right. Uh, trying to win at everything. I was very competitive from sports and it kind of translated into the rest of my life. Some healthy ways and, and other 
very unhealthy ways as well. And the unhealthy ways caught up to me, you know, when I hit 30. And, you know, I'm still dealing with it every day. I'm still growing and learning and developing, you know, in no way am I a perfect human being. But I, I learned at 30, I kind of started waking up to realizing like, wow, there's a lot of things I'm doing that felt like they were working on the surface. You know, I was making lots of money. I was getting accomplishments and all these other things. But I felt like I was just suffering and in constant internal pain on the inside. And I didn't know why. So I just kept doing more of what I was doing to try to eliminate the pain and it never went away. And I think I was, you know, probably too aggressive at times and probably said things that were mean at times and, you know, probably just didn't make people always feel good. When I felt triggered, I attacked other people. Mm-hmm. And as much as I was a loving, fun person, you know, 95% of the time when I was triggered, I went into a place of wearing a mask, trying to protect myself, trying to defend myself, trying to be right. And that hurt me. At the end of the day, that hurt me and, and it hurt other people. And so I just started waking up and being like, this is not working. This model of living life is not working. And I started to go on a journey of more discovery, of healing, of forgiveness, of everything. And uh, realized that the way that I'd been living my life was not the best way for me anymore. And I didn't think it was the best way for a lot of men. So I went into researching more how men can be more vulnerable and open up and have more loving, caring lives. And I think if we live with more compassion for each other as opposed to judgment, then it's just a little better environment for us. Well, I think you learning that at 36 years of age is it's, uh, it's pretty telling it's an advantage because it takes, you know, I'm 55 years old. So I, we all go through those learning curves. My learning curve of all that probably happened a little bit later than yours did. It's weird. It's like, it's like mm. men in particular, well, I don't know, probably men and women, but we're talking about men right now. And this book talks a lot about men. You do go through that stage where you, yeah. You got to show how cool you are. Yep. Yep. And, and you know, think, and, and to go back to your point, I think it's really easy for us to look at people online and, and see their highlight reels on social media or what they're posting and be like, wow, how do they have it all together? And, and how are they so successful? But in reality, you know, when we, I, I think it was Roosevelt that said comparison is the thief, thief of joy. You know, there's a lot underneath the surface for everyone that's posting their success stories online as well. You know, you might see that they're hitting these numbers or they're getting these accomplishments, but we're all human beings facing human experiences that have ups and downs. And, uh, you know, Instagram is a highlight reel usually for people. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I want to kind of relate this messaging to our whole theme of relationship marketing. I have a book out, uh, Power of Human Connection how relationship marketing is transforming the way people succeed. And that book is more than just a marketing book. It's more than just a relationship marketing book. It's actually a personal development book too. Mm -hmm. Because we talk in there about three different types, you know, three different areas, you know, what relationship marketing really is. And we define it very clearly. And and, then how relationship marketing fits within the traditional uh, sales and marketing structure. What are the three, the three things? Yeah, your three things. What are the three things in the book for you? So, well, the three, I'm, what I'm explaining is the three sections of the book. So the first gotcha. section defines what relationship marketing really is. Gotcha, gotcha. Second section defines how, what, what real relationship marketing, how it fits in the traditional marketing and sales channels. Gotcha. But the third one, I think kind of goes more in line with this. The, the third part of the book is what is the most important relationship you can create and that relationship is with yourself. Yeah, of course. There's six chapters. The last six chapters are all personal development related relationship with self kind of stuff. And that's what I pick up with this because, and and I kind of want to, I'm going to attempt to tie them, tie the two together. So this book the mask of mask, the mask of, by the way, it's a little bit of a tongue twister there, the mask yeah. of masculinity. Yep. And you could explain what it's about more, more than I can, but I just, I'll just do my brief, brief reader's digest. You know, it's again, the mask, the, it, well, actually the, it says it all, the mask of masculinity. We put this mask on. We as men put this mask on that you just described. Um, 
and we got to be on top of the world. We got to look the best. We got to be the coolest. We we're competitive as all get out. We want to be better than the other guy. Yeah. That's the mask, right? I mean, that, that, that's the mask. So now you talk about that, but then, but then you talk in here about, okay, when do you peel back the mask and get down to what's real? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the whole message of relationship marketing. So relationship marketing, marketing is the mask. You know, it's the marketing side. We're all trying to be this cool on top of the world, but it's actually when you peel the mask back, it's like you said, relationships, you have nothing without relationships. And I think the key, you know, the key to success in life is relationships and the key to successful relationships, in my opinion, is vulnerability. And when I mean vulnerability, it's not like I need to be crying all day in front of someone type of vulnerability. It's revealing who you are, shedding these masks, shedding this persona, this image, and opening up your heart so people can see you and connect with the real you. And when you connect the real you to someone else, they feel a difference. They don't just see someone handing out a business card saying, what can I do for you here, partner? Like you feel an authentic energy and an openness that becomes a channel of possibilities. And when you open up more yourself and reveal yourself more of who you truly are, which you might need to do some work to figure out who you truly are. You know, for me, I had to do a lot of work to say, who am I? I don't know. I had an identity. I had to shed this identity. I don't know who I am in the world. So I think it's an ongoing journey to discover who we are. But when we can reveal that or just be authentic about like, hey, I'm trying to figure out who I am, you know, not try to put a mask on like we know, but hey, I'm figuring myself out right now. Like that's vulnerable. Yeah, and I tell you, that's the key. Again, that's the key to it's key to relationship marketing. That's it. Just be that's you, it. man. Just be you. Uh, do you? Um, you know, be transparent with people, and you, you just got to be real. And th- this is the other thing I want to talk about. <laughs> All of those things are so much more important in today's business world than they've ever been before. Yeah. Like everything we just talked about what this book talks about your book is so much more important to, to for success today than it was even 10 years ago. Why is that? I just think people, um, they see through the fake and phony and tactics and strategies more than ever now. And they're just not, there's so many options available that they're just not going to buy into someone who they feel like, eh, I just, something feels weird about that person. You know, life is an enrollment game and we're either enrolling people in our vision or unenrolling them by our way of being and how we show up. And, um, that's the thing, you know, sales is all about enrollment. I mean, there's enrolling you in something or you're enrolling me why you don't want it. And, um, your ability to connect authentically is what's going to give you the best opportunity to build a relationship and then hopefully do business in some way. And I think that's the goal, but there's so much fluff. There's so many tactics and strategies and, and people feel that. So I think the more you can be, that's why I think one of the reasons I think my podcast has done so well is because I'm always leading with vulnerability. I'm always sharing like, man, I messed up yesterday. I did something stupid. I shouldn't have done this. Like, Oh, uh, I, I hurt someone in my, I said something stupid to my team. Gosh, I was a poor leader. I'm trying to be better. Can you show me how to be better? You know? Oh man did something stupid with my girlfriend. Shoot. What am I doing? Can you show me how to be better? And I think by me leading with that vulnerability, my guests are being like, you know what? I did something similar. You know, I'm not, and it just connects and you build this relationship when there's vulnerability. So yeah. Good stuff. Good process, man. It's a journey. It's a process. And, um, that's it. But the key to success is relationships and the key to successful relationships is that authentic vulnerability. So Kobe Bryant, what was it like interviewing Kobe Bryant? It was pretty amazing. I actually booked it at six o'clock the night before for that next morning at 7 a.m. And so it was like this quick turnaround. I think because I didn't have time to get nervous. Yeah. It was like magic. Yeah, it was. Um, I watched it. It was incredible. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing because I didn't know what to expect. I really didn't have a lot of time to do research uh, because I kind of found out about it the night before 
And I had to go to an event that night to go support another friend. Um, my friend, Lindsay Sterling, who I believe is from Utah, was performing. So I went to go watch her concert. I didn't get back till midnight. I had to get up at 5 a.m., drive to Orange County, get there at 6.15 in the office to be ready an hour before. And I had about three minutes with him before we started. Wow. So we, had like, we, we only were supposed to have, I think, like 20 minutes. And then he extended it to 45. Um, and I had three minutes with him to build relationship, to spend, you know, 35 years of my life of experience building relationships came down to three minutes to see what I could do to create some type of connection to make a great interview. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, what am I going to do? You know, this, he's going to put a mic on and then we're going to start in a couple of minutes. There's a whole team of people around us, you know, his PR team, everything. It's, you know, chaos. And I remember saying, I, so I did enough research to where I knew what he would like to talk about. And right away, I just said, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time. I know you're very busy. And I wanted to acknowledge you for how you show up at every Olympic game. You know, in the Olympics that you're in, so many athletes that I know uh, have said that you were so cool, so good with your time, are willing to take photos with everyone, celebrated everyone else's event. And I just really think it's cool that you were that much of a leader to show up for other Olympians. And I said, you know, I play on the USA Olympic handball team and um, I'm training for that right now. And he cut me off and he said, you play handball. I love handball. I used wow. to play. I used to play it in Europe when I lived in Europe. I watch it during the Olympics. It's one of my favorite sports to watch. It's so cool. And so we talked about things that I knew he was excited about right away in the first minute or two, right in that conversation. And then I just said, you know, um, and then her, the, his publicist was like, who else have you interviewed on the show? And I said, uh, a couple of people's names that I knew he was friends with. You know, I was like, I've had Novak Djokovic and this person. And he goes, oh, Novak, he's like my brother. You know, so I just knew based on research, I saw who he was following on social media. And I was like, okay, we have some mutual connections. So I think anytime, and this is what I was doing 10 years ago in my LinkedIn networking days. I would do research to see where they went to school, how many relationships we have in common, you know, basic relationship marketing stuff, I guess. It's like seeing these points of interest. And I just kind of organically was like saying these things and having conversations that I thought he'd be interested in. And um, I remember his publicist, like the, the, the night before or whatever, was like, okay, you can't ask these 10 questions. You can't go over this. You can't, you know, all these limitations. And after this kind of three minutes, I said, you know, um, I said, you know, your publicist told me like what I can and can't talk about. Is there anything else off limits that you don't want to talk about? And he said, ask me anything you want. And so I think that three minute interaction of me having researched, but me also having six years of practice at this in the podcast yeah. um, and really making it about him, expressing gratitude, acknowledging him for his gifts before we even started, you know, just making it about him, loving on him, being vulnerable, it just made the interview incredible. And the guy was talking about love and intimacy and all these things that he never talks about. And yeah. then it went viral online, you know, and Sports Illustrated picked it up and Olympics.com and NBC and Lakers.com. And ESPN was sharing it with all their accounts and it just spread. Yeah, it has a half a million views or something like that, at least when I, when I watched yeah. it. Yeah. It's probably a lot more than that, but – um, well, I'll tell you what, for all of our listeners, uh, this, uh, there's a valuable lesson in bringing up the Kobe Bryant interview story. Have you explained how you prepared for that? Yeah. And now to make that lesson complete for all of our listeners, I'm telling you, please, man, please go to youtube.com forward slash Lewis house. I think it's right there. Like when did you pop right up? The top. It's right at the top. You'll see it's like, it's the first thing. It's the interview with Kobe Bryant. Click on and watch that because I'm telling you, it's, it's a, it do. I'm telling you, it's amazing because when you start that interview, it looked to me like you guys had We're been best friends. For, yeah. He, I I mean, mean, that's what I thought. I thought, geez, he's good friends with, he's good friends with this guy. You know, he, I think that's a testament to Kobe because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if he was going to be cold or what, but he is just, 
a cool, nice guy. I mean, my interaction with him is he was a very loving, kind, giving, authentic human being. And, um, you know, I know he's had challenges in the past and different stuff like we all have, but he really gave and he gave and he shared and he was open and he was willing to go wherever. And I think it's a testament to who he is now and what he's creating for his life. You know, it's interesting to me, a lot of high profile celebrity uh, I've heard, and I know some myself that they have those attributes. They have those caring attributes. My next door neighbor is Jerry Sloan. Jerry mm-hmm. Sloan was the coach of the Utah Jazz for yeah. 20 years in the Hall of Fame. He's an icon uh, in the, the world of basketball. Very, very, very well known throughout the NBA community and whatnot. He's struggling a little bit today now with Parkinson's disease and stuff in his later years. But I, we moved into that neighborhood 10 years ago, and he was still coaching at the time. He was still the head coach of the Utah Jazz. By far, by far. The kindest neighbor in that neighborhood was Jerry Sloan. Yeah, yeah. By far. I mean, like he he came over to the house, introduced himself like he needed to, you know, he he always waved, he always That's invited cool. you to come over. Our talks across the fence were amazing. <laughs> he told me stories about Carl Malone and John Stockton and the whole deal. But the the reason I bring up that story is I, I I think there's a lesson to be learned in that. There's a lesson that some of these high profile people, mm-hmm. they, they, they keep their foundation. They stay grounded. And there's yeah. an important lesson in that. Um, these guys are playing in the major leagues. Thurl Bailey was a player there. He's become a very, very good friend of mine. One of the kindest people that I've ever known. Do you know Nancy Lieberman? Do you by chance know who she is? Sounds familiar. Nancy Lieberman, she's a big in the in the basketball world. She she runs the Nancy Lieberman Foundation where they go and, and she's big. I mean, she knows she's she knows everybody. She played she was on the first women's Olympic team. Wow. Um she, you know, played in the WNBA. She was a coach in the NBA. She's she big time. She started the Nancy Lieberman Foundation and she uh puts together basketball um, facilities in inner cities for kids. And she does these basketball programs. It's incredible. Just, just wow. incredible. 